Here's a, a quote by Francoise de Toit. Mankind's union with God is the original thought that inspired creation. Just think about that. When you're feeling that God doesn't love you and you're not accepted or you're feeling guilty or condemned because of what you might have done, think of this thought. Mankind's union with God is the original thought that inspired creation and it is actually God's a, a continual intention and desire that we would be in union with him and in union with creation itself. So it's a key to receiving and experiencing what God has already done. So we're looking at restoring first love. That's returning us back to our original relationship with the family of God, Father, Son, Spirit, slash Mother, and the intimacy of that union unveils our true identity. For me, this was an ongoing process, a journey, an adventure that I had no idea that I was going to go on. And I really didn't have much idea about what was happening. But now I look back and I can see this amazing adventure that I've been on. And we've been looking at it in a process of a romance. So the marriage process between God and man is a romance, the romance of the ages to restore our origin and union. And the process has five parts, Lakar, Segula, Ketuba, Mikvah, and Hupa. And we're still focusing on the first part of that, the Lakar. That relational process is where God brings us into union and oneness once again in a degree of intimacy which goes way beyond I have ever dreamed was possible. So the car stage of the relationship is where God declares, I want you to know that I desire you to be mine. And doesn't everyone want to know that we're someone wants to desire us to be theirs? And, and I think that's what God was trying to get over to me. And it took a long time to get that over to me because I couldn't believe that. I knew it theologically, but that's very different from knowing it in emotional practical terms i want you to know that i desire you to be mine and then the next stage segula the stage of the relationship where god actually declares you are my treasured possession you are the apple of my eye you are the most important person in the world to me and he wants everyone to feel that special because we are all special to him so my journey to experience first love involved the father revealing my inner self spirit and soul through the gateways so i could understand myself better and eventually that i would understand my innermost being the merkaba and my energy gates and all that went with how he has made us to be that i couldn't have possibly even thought about back in those days but i began to understand my true identity as a son of god bit by bit to ascension by ascension increasing levels of revelation and truth and in the early days of when i was first encountering these things back in 2008 and then significantly in 2010 i had no grid of reference for the experiences that were outside of the bible now many of my experiences i could find sort of in the bible but there were some things which were beyond that so God used various Bible verses to give me something to focus on in meditation. And those Bible verses became a doorway to my encounters. Now, I no longer need to use a Bible verse to create a doorway. The door is always open and I am connected and dwelling in all those realms. So it's just a matter of shifting my consciousness and shifting my thinking to engage anywhere that I have been or anywhere that I um, want to be in this context but in the initial stages having something to get my focused attention was important so there was revelation 3 21 revelation 22 1 genesis 2 10 psalm 23 which was a specific one that i used a lot john 4 14 john 7 38 isaiah 58 11 ezekiel 37 there were a number of things which were helpful to give me a reference point and i know a lot of us need a reference point to begin with before we learn how to engage by intention and by choice. You know, I 
when I first encountered heaven in 2008, I desperately wanted to go back into that experience, but I couldn't. I didn't know how. I tried every technique that I came up and tried finding and Googled and looked at other ministries. I tried everything to go back into that encounter. It wouldn't work because I didn't know how. Even though I had visionary experiences at times and other things, I didn't know how. So when I then had that, I never wanted to lose it. When I went and engaged it in 2010, I didn't want to ever lose it. So I asked the father to show me, how can I re-engage this? So then I didn't use a verse as much as the experience I already had and the testimony of that experience. But there were verses that were part of my journey. Um, and I'll read some of them today and at other times. Genesis 2.10 is one. Now a river flowed out of Eden. Now Eden was the heavenly garden to water the garden, which was east of Eden, which is earth. And from there it divided and became four rivers. Now, obviously, this division was on earth, but the source came from heaven, from Eden in heaven to the earth. And it divided into four. Now, why did it divide into four? Why did it say it divided into four? Because there was some spiritual significance to that. And the father took me on a journey of engaging heaven and engaging within me, because now I am the place where the river flows. I am the garden. And each of us is the garden where heaven's source, the river of life, flows into our innermost being from within our spirit, from within, within that place of intimacy and first love. So the Father took me on this journey of navigating those four rivers through the four chambers of my heart into deeper intimacy. And these were pictures that God gave, and they were given to quite a few people at the time to help people engage. So when I was going through these encounters, I didn't know if the four rivers and chambers were spiritual places in me, literal, figurative. Were they metaphoric places of the process within my soul that was going on? You know, I didn't really know. So I just went with it. You know, I didn't try to overanalyze it or try and figure it out or come up with a definitive. I just went with the experiences. The experiences were a blessing and they began to open up a whole different perspective. Now, looking back, I know that this was a progression that I was being led through, this was my metamorphosis back to my origin. I was being transformed and changed at a deepest level. So on that journey through my heart, the father restored my identity as a son in the intimacy of our relationship to discover true unconditional love. That was the lakar. And that lakar was multiple experiences. It wasn't just God looked in my eyes one day and says, I want you to know that I want you to be mine. You know, that would have been great. And he did that, but in different ways, because even if he said that to me, I doubt whether I would have fully embraced or understood it. So I went with the process that was going on and the deepening intimacy that took place that now I look back and I can see in that perspective. So my origin, my spirit's memory of who I am was restored and remapped onto my mind, both conscious and subconscious. Now that took place probably in around 2015. So that was five years after my first encounter in heaven, when I actually had the first encounter with my spirit's memory. God was leading me on that process all the way through, deep restoring first love to me but it was too good to be true and i think that's what a lot of people feel well how can it be that god could love me unconditionally because everything we've been brought up is about conditional and to experience unconditional love was something which was beyond what i was able to take on cognitively but god gave me the experiences that began to change what i believed and what I knew to be true. So at the time, I was just following wherever God led. I didn't know where I was going, what each experience meant. Looking back, of course, now I can see the process that God was using to restore that first love that was taking place all the way through. 
but God knew what I needed to come into the full experience of that. And he took me on that journey. It wasn't an easy journey. And, you know, I'm a person who wants to understand and know what's going on. And I tried, but I realized the more I tried to figure it out, I was hindering what was going on. So I sort of gave up on that after a while, particularly after 2012, which is sort of one of the key things in this process where I eventually got into the the whole thing where God separated and reintegrated my soul and spirit. So looking back from where I am now, I can see the father was orchestrating my encounters like a conductor and the orchestra was playing the song of my identity and destiny. The song of all songs is a harmony of frequencies that entrained me to resonate with who I am. There was a process going on, which is which is scientific, if you like, and was drawing me and wooing me, but in the romance terms, to come closer, to come nearer, to come deeper, to experience this amazing unconditional love. And I was being drawn and wooed into that. Technically, those frequencies were causing me to resonate with the truth. Because actually, I was believing lies. So I see now that my origin was being unveiled. My identity was being revealed. I was being restored and transformed, metamorphosized, metamorphosed from who I was shaped to be by the world around me. And all of us have been shaped by the world. Romans 12 talks about being pressed into a mold, a worldly mold. And all of us have been shaped by that mold, whereas God has a different mold that he wants us to be poured into. And so we find our our true shape, our true identity, because that metamorphosis process takes me from one shape into the shape who God said I am. So my encounters stretch me. They stretch my belief systems. They stretch me beyond. You know, and that was part of the process. It had to be a stretching. I couldn't stay in a comfort zone. I had to be stretched. I had to go further. I had to go deeper. I was always going beyond my cognitive knowledge. I was always going beyond my understanding. And these experiences and encounters took me beyond my wildest expectations. You know, you can only sort of think about something from where you where you sit. But this is going beyond what I could have ever even imagined or thought. And I journaled every experience. Now, those journals became the doorways that enabled me to go back into the encounters. God showed me that I could use the testimony of the previous experience, which I journaled and revisited. And then I entered into it again. And when I asked him, well, how can I make sure that I can come back here every day? He just said, well, use the door that was there yesterday and you can go through the same doorway. And I began to choose by intention to engage every single day of my life. And bar four months when I was in the dark cloud experience, I have engaged every single day of my life since then. Now, I use Revelation 321 where Jesus was knocking on the door, I used that as the image that I could picture on the inside experience because my external experiences to start with were were not my doing. I was taken in a trance. I was taken into those experiences. God took me there, but he wanted to show me that I could choose to have these experiences within me Therefore, that verse was a key verse. So I chose to open the door of my first love gate every day. But that was just the beginning of my journey. That was amazing to find that there was a place in me that God dwelled and that I could open that door and let God fill my spirit, soul, being and whole body rather than him being contained in a small part of my spirit. I chose to open that gate every day. Now it's a state of being that I live continually in, but it was very helpful to picture Jesus knocking on a door. The handle was on my side and I opened it every day. That was my choice to say, come in. 
I welcome you to come and fill me, fill my spirit, fill my soul, fill my body, flow through me. Eventually, I actually found that I could go back through that gate and follow the river of life to Eden's heavenly garden and even to the father's garden and many other places in that realm. Now, to start with, I was going up into that realm. So Jesus was a door. And let's say like Bethel at Bethel, you had Jacob with a gateway of heaven and a ladder going from earth to heaven, which you could go up into heaven through. And that was my initial experiences. And that was what I was doing every day. I was going up Jacob's ladder effectively or the stairway to heaven, if you prefer a song title. Um, and I was going up every day that route. But one day we was in a group encounter where I was leading a group into experiencing these things. So we were all encountering and I was basically saying, look, picture a door. Jesus is open, is there. You open the door, you invite Jesus, and then you encounter God or the Father through that experience. And then we all shared various things that had happened. And one lady, she said, oh, I went through the gate and I found myself in heaven. And I thought, why didn't I think about that? I never thought. Then, then it struck me, well, that's where the flow comes from. That's where the river of life is. That's where Eden is. And if I am now a garden to be filled and flowing in that life, oh, it makes total sense. So I, next time I had an encounter, I went straight back through the door and I found myself in the river of life in the heavenly Eden. And it's it's funny these things happen. Sometimes you just don't think. And all of a sudden you get a ha-ha moment. The light comes on. And you thought, why didn't I think of that before? So I began to engage a different way, which was internal, that gave me access into that realm. So it was a connection that I had within me continually. So then Jesus or the Father, sometimes the Spirit, guided me. They helped me follow the river of life from heaven, through my spirit, into the garden of my heart. So I saw there was a flow. And then from the garden of my heart, following four rivers, four chambers, filling me and in bringing me on this process where I came into a restored place of identity in that all, I had this flow every day. I knew where it was going and I could take that journey. But the reverse journey was also true. I could start in my spirit, go through that gate, end up in Eden in heaven, and then engage all the things that were in that heavenly garden and beyond. So this was something which was two way and began to flow. And then I just had to think about which way I wanted to go. And usually what I would do is when I invited God's presence to come within me and I began to engage Father there or Jesus there, I would let him guide me to where to go and if i felt to go into the garden of my heart that's where i went if i felt to go back into eden that's where i went sometimes father just walked there and i walked with him into those places and what i began to discover was that i began to see a, a uniting in my soul and spirit a union began to take place but there was a limit to it and that's where the separation and reintegration of my soul and spirit was still to come, which opened up a door that went way beyond what, again, what I could have possibly imagined or thought when I went through that process. So John 7, 37, 38 were basically, again, a Bible verse that I used to connect with originally. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So when I opened that first love gate, I would engage and I would drink because there was life flowing. I would drink of the source, the energy, the flow of life. Obviously, John 4 talks about a fountain bubbling up to eternal life. And ultimately, that is the spirit. That is life itself. You can drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What do we need to do? Come to him and drink and see the flow that would increase, starting as a trickle, 
ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, until it is absolutely flowing with life and we are flowing with it. But we need to come to Jesus. He's the source. That's where we find the abundant life that we've been promised. That's where we find true rest. Because again, Jesus said, come to me, all those who are weary and burdened and find rest. So this is where life and rest are in the source. Let's not create our own source. Let's not draw from the source, which we have created from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's draw from the source of life, the tree of life. So I had many Lakar and Sagula experiences, encounters with God as father and spirit slash mother, family. And this is what I've discovered. They're, they're family. They're relationship. So these experiences over many years revealed first love. They revealed unconditional love. They reveal my true identity and my true origin. And each experience added and built. So it increased and increased and increased. Now, the experiences were often in association with gardens or rivers. And those gardens and rivers were what I used to engage and engage within me because I saw myself as a garden. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. Now, I guess like many of you, you probably have been places where you would say there were scorched places, dry places, places where you weren't really flowing, where it felt really difficult. But the promise is he will guide us and satisfy our desire in the scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden. Well, where's the water coming from? From heaven, from the river of life. And like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So we become within us a source, a spring. But actually, rivers of living water flow from our innermost being. So they flow around us and we can create a dynamic around us which is bringing life to scorched places in the earth. So where there's dryness, where people are suffering, where people don't know the truth, where they are weak, then we can come and we can let them drink from the flow that's coming from us. We can give them everything that we've received. So this was a picture that helped me when I began to engage the garden of my heart that this was a place which was flowing. And I was like this garden. This was the true me. This was not that I was a dry waste desert, even though I might have felt like that in the past. No, I am a watered garden because he is guiding me and he's satisfying the desires of my heart. Jeremiah 31, 12 also, and their life will be like a watered garden and they will never languish again. So again, this is a promise of who we would be when rivers of living water will be flowing within us again. And Romans 5, 5 describes the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And this is Paul's description of the same thing that Jesus was describing, that the love of God is flowing in our hearts, is being poured out like a river. So we can continuously experience his love within. We just choose to engage. We always have the choice and the ability to engage love. God has never removed that. It's our choice which path we follow, whether we're following the path of, in a desert where it's dry and barren, or whether we're following the path to the tree of life in which there is life, abundance, joy, peace, and love flowing. So Psalm 23, 2, let me lie down. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Now, some versions of this say he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's a wrong translation. He lets me lie down. He invites me. He gives me the opportunity of lying down. He doesn't force me or beat me to lie down. He gives me the opportunity and invites me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside those quiet waters. 
the waters of peace, which is flowing in the river of life. And he restores my soul. I don't have to restore my own soul. I just have to lie down and let him, with the life that's flowing, restore my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Where do I walk? The path of righteousness is a path of my true identity because I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I've always been the righteousness of God in Christ from his perspective. But he guides me into the true path that my life would take. You could say the path of righteousness is my destiny and my destiny is my identity outward for the sake of his name. Now, for the sake of his, what's his name? Love. So for the sake of love, he lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness because he loves me. Because I'm made in his image. Therefore, in his name, I am a son of God for the sake of love, which is so amazing. And so I would lie down in green pastures every day. Every time I went to sleep at night, I would engage lying down by choice in a green pasture by quiet waters so the shepherd could restore my soul while I slept. Because my soul rests, my body sleeps, and my spirit continues to be life and living and abundant. And I don't, my spirit doesn't need to sleep and doesn't sleep. So every night I would put my body to sleep by choosing to go into that place of rest my spirit would my spirit would engage heaven i would lie down and i would make myself available for all the adventures that my spirit could have or all the things god might want me to do at night whilst my soul was being restored every day and i still do this every night so i do this and i go to sleep you know very very rarely am i asleep more than 30 seconds after i've done this because it's a safe place of rest in which I know I'm going to engage in a place of intimacy. It's an amazing place. And it's a place I, I continue to encourage everyone to find within them a place where they can rest, a place where they can find that life-giving watered garden. So the garden was my place of rest, restoration, lying down by the river of life, all of those amazing things, my soul comforting me during this process of transformation that I was to undergo. I learned to tend and cultivate and create the garden of my heart. Because I went from not knowing the garden even existed within me to beginning to cultivate and tend it. But then I began to create in the garden because the garden looks the way I want it to look. You know, the plants I like in there, the trees I like in there, I've chosen. There's mountains in my garden. There are everything in my garden reflects my experiences with God and the, the experiences I've had in heaven. They're reflected in what is in my heart. Because every testimony is stored there. Now, I'm going to share some of my encounters of Lakar in the gardens and in the rivers. And I'm just going to share these as stories, if you like, of what happened to me with the encouragement that if this has happened to me, anything can happen to you as well. All of it can. You know, this is because God wants us to go through this process of going into deeper and in intimacy and relationship. So the first experience I had was in 2008 and i went into heaven through a portal which appeared in front of me at my desk and i found myself in this place to start with i didn't know where it was but there was a river of flowing but it was a river of fire which is an interesting first experience and it was somewhat i could feel the fire it, it was you know flowing like a molten fire um and but I immediately started to think, well, where am I? And I remembered the scripture from Daniel, which talks about a river flowing from the throne of God. So immediately I thought, well, where's the throne of God? And then I encountered a series of stones or big sort of 
flagstones, but they were swirling with energy and life. They were living stones and they were like steps going up. And I assumed that they would go and go up to the throne of God. And so I began to engage. Now I look back now and I know that these are the firestones in the heavenly Eden that are described in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel. And they are described there. And the, what was going on there was described. But I went, my first experience was going to those firestones. And as soon as I stepped on the first stone, it was like nothing I'd ever felt before in my life. Now, when I got baptized in the spirit, it was like liquid love was poured into me. And that was an amazing experience from someone who struggled emotionally and different things in my life. But this was beyond anything I'd ever experienced before. It's literally I became one with the stone and I became enmeshed in the energy, sort of consumed with it. It was just amazing. I stepped on the stone and I became part of it. That stone was love, emotional love, deep emotional love where I felt loved. And this was beyond anything I'd ever experienced before. And I just rejoiced in it. And it was so amazing. It was an overwhelming experience. And this experience was outside of normal time. So it felt like I was standing on that stone, being immersed, flowing, being part of love. And it could have been for weeks. You know, it felt like a totally immersive experience. It was way beyond anything that I'd ever experienced before. And eventually I managed to take a step to the next step, which was joy. And then, then I was immersed in joy at a level, again, I'd never experienced. This was emotional joy, not just the sort of the joy that's deep down in our hearts that we don't ever show or really feel. This is real. And it was a real sense of love and joy and peace. And this was all the fruit of the Spirit. And there were nine stones that went up to the throne of God. The first one was love. That set the pattern for all that revealed the true nature of God, because that was true, unconditional love. There was nothing conditional about it. I wouldn't have named it as that then. But now I look back and I know what I what I was feeling from the context of what I now know. Then it was just a, a hugely overwhelming experience of wonderful love. Wonderful love. I mean, it was so, so deep. You know, and I still remember it and I still can feel it just by thinking about it. Even now, it was such an intense experience. And I took a few people back into that place with me a few years later when I went back, because I didn't go back there until probably two years later. No, but this is 2008, probably four years later. And I took some people with me and they were so overwhelmed they could hardly function for a few days it was such an intense experience but it was the beginning experience and then in 2010 when i went into um that heavenly place and i went into heaven by going you know up the ladder if you like or just going into that realm as god took me into the realm i had many many experiences many many encounters and then one day, the, the father took me to the place and there was a, a little area of grass, probably about, I don't know, five or six feet of grass in, a, in an area, probably a couple of square meters or a couple of square yards. or not very big at all, but there was a tree there and a little bench. And there was a swing in the tree and the father encouraged me to sit in the swing and he pushed me. And every time he pushed me, I felt love. I felt the father's love for a child, for me, because I never experienced that as a child in, with my natural father. But he pushed me. And every time he pushed me, it was it was such a wonderful, joyous thing to be pushed. And truth was imparted and life was imparted. And it was wonderful. And we went back there 
a number of times and we sat on a bench and we were talking to one another and he was talking to me and I had some amazing encounters there. And then one day he said, do you know where this is? And I thought, well, this must be our special place in heaven. And he said, well, no, this is the garden of your heart. And I and I've, I didn't know I had a garden. Where's the garden? And he said, within you. We're within you right now, and you're experiencing me in the garden of your heart. And that is where I found Psalm 23. That is where I sat down, eventually realized that the river of life was flowing there. This garden, as I walked into the garden from this area, because I went back into it and I began to walk. As I walked, the garden expanded in front of me. It grew but the grass expanded out. And what I did was I began to tend and cultivate that garden because this is the garden of my heart. This is who I am. I am a well-watered garden, but I just never did anything with it because I didn't know it existed. So I began to go there. Every day I would go into the garden of my heart. I would sort of see it expand and initially, I started cultivating it by planting seeds of testimony. So every time I had a testimony of experiencing God, whether it be in heaven or my first love gate, anywhere else, I would take that seed and I would see it like a seed. I would dig a little hole by the river of life. I would plant the seed. I would take some handfuls of water and I would pour the water onto the seed, cover it up. And then I would speak it into life and it would grow immediately. And so that would be a, a tree with fruit on it immediately or a bush, depending on whatever it happened at the time. And I wasn't really at that point thinking about what it was going to look like. But eventually I did and I chose what it looked like. But initially it just grew. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. There is a tree with fruit on it in the garden of my heart. And then I would take that fruit, eat a piece of the fruit figuratively, and I will be back into that experience, going deeper into it. And then as I began to share these testimonies with other people, it was like me taking a piece of that fruit off the tree and giving it to someone else and said, here, taste and see that God is good. And people were then beginning to experience through activations and through encounters that I initially did with the my friends and small groups of people within the church and, and then eventually going wider afield i planted every testimony within my garden so i have within my garden a whole forest of trees all bearing fruit that i can eat of and i can give away all of the time because i have tended and i have cultivated that garden and eventually i began to know that I could choose what was in the garden. And so I would choose a mountain range in the in the distance. I would choose waterfalls. I would choose areas of plants that I liked just by thinking about it and choosing that my garden would be filled with with life. And I've continued to do that. And my garden, I am that garden. That is my life. I am the testimony of my experiences with God. And they are beautiful experiences. But it didn't stop there. And every day I would open my first love gate. I would invite Father, Son, Spirit to engage me. And then I would say, where are we going today? What are we going to do today? You know, and I began to find the places in heaven, the courts and the mountains in heaven, my thrones in heaven. And I got caught up with the kingdom and the authority I had there and with the court of angels and all of the amazing stuff. And I would be like, where are we going today? What are you going to show me today? And then one day the father just hugged me. And he didn't say a thing. And I was like, well, where are we going today? And he just didn't say a thing and he wouldn't let go. And he wouldn't let me go anywhere. And he just hugged me. Because it was a danger that I was getting 
too much wanting the experiences and particularly the governmental legislative experiences rather than the first love. And so he embraced me. He hugged me. And sometimes Jesus and the spirit, all three would embrace me and I would be in the center of them. And I couldn't go anywhere and do anything. So after a few days of sort of minor struggling and thinking, well, why can't I go anywhere? I sort of gave up and surrendered to it. And then such a beautiful thing happened in that he imparted by cardiogenosis the knowledge of who he was as love to me at another level. He never said a word. And this went on for months and months. And I learned more about God's nature, character, essence, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. I learned their frequency. I learned their fragrance. I learned their song. And I knew them from that close encounter, from that hug, from that impartation of who they were, that I began to know them at a deeper level, beyond anything I'd even experienced before, just by this hug, by this heart to heart hug, because it was a heart to heart hug. I was embraced by love. And that love began to reveal the true nature of God himself to me. It was an, an amazing experience that I fondly look at and remember. And I also remember the warning, don't get caught up in doing stuff and forget the source of love and life. The relationship always becomes before the responsibility. Relationship flows into everything else. But then I then started to encounter the river of life and I started to encounter the river of life in heaven. I found the river of life flowing through my first love gate and flowing through the garden of my heart. And I kept following that river and I found there were things in the river which were life giving because it's the river of life after all. And sometimes I would be in that river. I would go up the river. I would go down the river. I would float in the river. I would sink in the river. I could breathe underwater in the river, which was a shock the first time it happened when I was thinking I'm going to drown. And actually, I could just breathe. I began to flow. I began following it wherever it went. And when I went back into Eden, into the heavenly garden, and I was in the river, and I began to sink into that river, I began to look and see what was in the river. And on the riverbed, there were gemstones, there were scrolls, there were other things that I was drawn to. So I would go down and I would take a gemstone and I would eat it because I wanted it to impart. Now, you know, that again, it comes from a Bible verse where a scroll was given and they were saying, take, eat, eat the scroll. So I would take a scroll that I found on the bottom of the river and I would take it and eat it. And as I would take it and eat it, there was an impartation. It would be imparted into my heart. Truth would be imparted. Revelation imparted. Love imparted. Identity imparted. And every time I began to engage the river and eat, I began to increase and expand and my experiential knowledge increased. Not just cognitive knowledge, but experience. These were things that I now knew by experience and encounter. There was such amazing truth that got revealed during this process. And then as I followed the river and I went up the river against the flow, but there's no resistance. You can go up and down without any resistance. I found this huge waterfall. There were several waterfalls, but there was one that drew me. And I went to the waterfall and I stood under the waterfall and it started cascading over me. It was an amazing sound, like the sound of many waters. And I found the voice of God was in that waterfall. The life of God was in that waterfall. And I began to think I'd like to go up here. But to start with, my mind was limited by what you can do on Earth. And this is where you start from. You start with the memory of what happens here at waterfalls. Now, I've experienced quite a number of waterfalls in my life, from Niagara to big, big ones 
in various other places of the world. But this was a, a waterfall that drew me. And so initially, I, I think, I can't remember, it was an angel, I think, took me by the hand and led me up the waterfall. And so I started to float up the waterfall rather than going down it. And then my mind got transformed and changed. And it was like, oh, I can go up and down. And I just played up and down, up and down, flowing in the waterfall, up and down, up and down, up and down. I forgot about what I was wanting to do, get up it and see where it went for quite a while. I was just enjoying myself. And every time I was in that waterfall, there was life flowing. And I realized there were no restrictions. And one day I was going up and down the waterfall and I went through the waterfall and I found this huge cave. And in this cave, there was someone sat in this cave at this sort of stony bench. And it was Enoch. And Enoch looked at me and said, I've got a quest for you. Now, I didn't know what that meant. And it gave me a scroll. And so I took the scroll and ate it as, as you do. But what it did, it birthed in me something which was going to be a process for the next number of years of my life. And then I've been back to that cave, which I call the cave of destiny. And I receive scrolls and I've received a number of quests from Enoch. And eventually the quest took me beyond beyond. And there were some things which were quite weird about it all and you know, I remember one of the quests was I said well what's the quest he said well I can't tell you you're only going to know when you finished it I thought oh well, that's really great um okay so I said okay well I'll accept you know and I began to engage that at that waterfall and you know I went up and I went down and I followed the river of life beyond that waterfall to the tree of life I went to the tree of life. I ate the fruit from the tree of life. And again, as I ate the fruit, there was an impartation, impartation of life into me. I received that life of the spirit. I received joy. I received peace and other characteristics as I ate that tree, which was always in season. And I went to the throne of grace because uh, I followed the river past the tree to the throne of grace where it flows from. And I, there was the father sat on the throne of grace and he, he put his hand down and he lifted me up and put me on his lap. And I began to place my head on his chest. Now, I knew the Bible verse, come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need. And, and I was like, yeah, but I don't have any needs <laughs> right now. I mean, I couldn't think of anything, but it didn't matter. I just embrace sitting on the father's lap and i found a place of comfort i found this was a place of acceptance of affirmation of approval his love again affirming me uh, in that place and then eventually there were some things that i was going through that i needed grace and help for and i would sit on the father's lap and i would just unburden myself and we can all do this we can come boldly to the throne of grace whatever the need in our life and what i realized is i didn't need to figure out how i could do this or how i could answer this or how i could work this out i just gave it to him i cast all my burdens onto him and his grace was sufficient for me to rest in his love and let him work but i had to stop working for his grace to outwork because like a lot of people i try to fix things i try and make it work i try and understand what's going on and i try and put this into place or that into place and to a degree i could do that you know i had a lot of experience in ministry i had a lot of experience in ministering to people a lot of experience of inner healing and ministry in my own life so i had the knowledge and understanding and a lot of wisdom but when I went there, I knew instinctively, you can't use any of that here. Because he works all things together for good. So I had to let him work. So I would come 
and I would burden unburden myself and I would just let him work by going to sleep sometimes almost on his lap and it was just an amazing sense again of his love that I began to trust him at a much deeper level because of what I felt and the affirmation and love that I received by sitting on his lap and it was amazing and one day I was in an encounter and I went to the waterfall again and I stood under it as I often did because I just loved waterfall cascading over me and the life cascading over me and I was just under it just really enjoying this life that was flowing over me and all of a sudden the river started to flow in multiple colors and all of these colors started to come down over me and I started to feel intense love the love that God felt for other people not just for me and I started to feel his love for those who were marginalized those who were abused those who are treated badly, those who are treated badly as children, those who have been hurt and rejected and terrible things have happened to them in their lives. And I just felt God's amazing, unconditional love. And I felt his compassion for them. And I was just, oh, you love people so much. You love those who are hurting. You love those who are going through these terrible things in their lives. You care for them. You want them to turn to you and receive that love and receive that care. And then all of a sudden, it was like all of these colors began to shift. And I began to feel God's unconditional love to all those who had hurt those people, the abusers, the traffickers, the rapists. I mean, just and I just felt in my soul, I felt. That, that's, that can be right. You can't love those people who've done these terrible things to these children of yours. And, he's, and he basically imparted, they're all my children and I love all of them the same. And my, my mind couldn't grasp that that could be true at that moment. But it kept pouring over me and I felt it. So I knew it was true. And my mind had to shift from its position of, well, some people deserve God's love. And, you know, to those people who do these terrible things, they don't. Now, that was a totally judgmental way of looking at it. And I was just being honest in feeling what I was feeling. But it changed my whole perspective. Because if God can love those people and does love those people, then what about me? What do I do to those people? Yeah, it's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to think and you can love those who need love and who need your love. But those people need God's love. They need our love as well. And it changed my whole perspective. So when I eventually began to engage people in the fire of God's love beyond death, I felt love for them. I felt compassion for them. I wanted them to embrace God's love and grace and be free from that place. This was the first encounter that started that ball rolling. And it was a powerful encounter that I went back to a number of times because I wanted to ensure that I embraced everything in that encounter that would totally remove judgment from my life in judging others because I now knew God loved them equally the same as he loved me and everybody else. So it was it was an amazing experience that took me again deeper into this relationship of love. And I carried on following the tree of life, the water of life. I went you know, to the tree of life. And, water. and one day I went to the father's throne of grace and I sat on his lap. And the river was flowing. And. I was enjoying it. And he, he said to me, do you want to see your scroll? And I thought, oh, yeah. You know, no, he didn't. He didn't say which scroll. He just said, do you want to see your scroll? And I thought, oh, the scroll of my destiny, because people were all talking about scrolls of destiny and all that sort of stuff in those days. And I thought, oh, yeah. And so along came the spirit of the fear of the Lord. With a scroll in his hand. 
Now, I'd not met the spirit of the fear of the Lord at, until this point. I'd met all the others, all the other seven spirits of God. I'd met them, wisdom and knowledge and understanding and, you know, all of them. I met all of them. And I'd not met the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And he had the scroll and he beckoned me to come off the father's lap. And I was thinking, do I want to go? Um, I'm not sure because it seemed quite intense. But I I went because I felt the father wanted me to go. So I went and he took me past along the river, along this path. And there was this opening like a big cave, looked like almost like a mouth of a lion. And I suddenly start to feel scared. And I started to feel like my soul was really scared to go in there. But he beckoned me in and he gave me the scroll and he left me to walk in. So I walked in. And it was dark and there was in the distance, there was like glowing. And so I walked with the scroll through this plate and I came to a fire that was burning, the consuming fire of God as a consuming fire. And I came to it and I felt, and this is a feeling that came a thought in my mind. Do you want me to open the seals on the scroll so you can see it? And at this point, I was like really quaking. I was like, I thought, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to come out of here if this scroll opens. But I said yes, and it opened, and the scroll opened, and on the scroll there was gold, silver, precious stones, and lots of wood, hay, and straw. And the fire of God's love came and consumed up the wood, hay, and straw, and the gold, silver, and precious stones gleamed. And everything on the, my testimony of my life as a Christian was purified and refined. And all the motives that I'd done things were refined. And then I, I started to back out and I got out. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord said, there's another side to your scroll because it's sealed front and back. And I thought, oh, um, OK. So I went back in this time, not quite as scared, but. It was an intense experience. I go back in. He says, do you want the scroll seals to be released? And I saw the other side of the scroll, which was an intensely moving experience. And what I felt was that the fire of God's from his eyes, and they were I could see his eyes burning and just burning eyes of fire. And the fire consumed. There was no guilt. There was no shame. There was no condemnation of anything I'd done with the wrong motive, anything I'd missed, every opportunity I'd missed, all the regrets in, in my life that I saw, and all of the wood, hay, and straw, there was not one ounce of negativity. There was just God's love showing me that none of that really mattered. He consumed it with his love. And again, I felt the love of God in such a way but it made me trust him at an even greater level. It was like, well, there's nothing in my life that you don't know, and you've just consumed it all with love. And it really did bless me to a, a huge degree and set me up for what was to happen in the future of you know, trusting him for being good and for loving me. Now, after that experience, the spirit of the fear of the Lord took me to another waterfall. This time I was at the top of the waterfall. And I couldn't even see the bottom. But he beckoned me to step off it. Now, I had experiences, obviously, of going up and down waterfalls, so I wasn't afraid of it, but I didn't know where it went. So I just stepped off and I went down this waterfall and I ended up in the father's garden. First time I'd been in the father's garden. This is different from Eden. It's part of Eden, but it's a special area within the father's garden. But when I was in, there was this, everything was still. There was like nothing was moving. It was it was amazing. But I was a little bit like, well, where's the father? Where is he? You know, and I couldn't see him. But then the father came 
and he just said rest. And so what I learned to do there was to be a complete rest. And so as I learned and I would go and lie down in there, I started to float in the air or whatever the atmosphere is. On the, I don't know. It's not really air, um, but I floated. So I wasn't lying on the ground. I was floating. And as I floated, I remember thinking, wow, this is good. And I started to rock and move. And the father just looked at me and a glance of his eye was, I just knew he'd be still. And so I just completely stopped moving, not just physically, but in every way. It was like I just come here to be me within the context of the father. And I learned to be at complete rest. And one day I was at such rest and such peace that I was floating that I spaghettified. It literally every particle of my whole being, just all of the things that held it together were just released. And I just went out and I became part of creation or I touched creation at a, I don't know, subatomic level, whatever it was, I felt creation and I felt creation's grown and I felt the longing of creation for sonship. I felt it and I knew creation wanted us to love it and to engage with it. And it was waiting for the revealing of our sonship. That was one of quite a number of experiences I had with creation like that. It was the first one. And I remember it intensely because it showed me God's love for creation and that God had made creation for us to love. And so I experienced that. And that, again, set me off on another path, um, which later on I went into in deeper and deeper ways. And then I experienced under the waterfall in the father's garden, a pool. And I in there, you just feel, well, I'm not supposed to do anything here. But I felt it was OK to just go in the water and float. So I floated in the water and I sank and I sank right down, right down. And the water underneath seemed to have a slight current. And it took me up this tunnel and uh, where I was going and that tunnel. And this I mean, this was a long time ago now. But that was my first experience of going into the eternal now. That tunnel took me from the Father's garden into the eternal now of the perichoresis of God in relationship. And I went into the eternal now and it completely, I was completely discombobulated. My mind could not contain. It was not capable of what it was in then, the state my mind was in then you know unrenewed and and whatever i couldn't embrace it so i i realized i had to engage it in the spirit and so i started to engage it spiritually sorry and and that's when i began to realize that in that place there is the access into the very origin of my design First time I experienced it was there. It was again intense. I didn't, I couldn't have put it into words. I, even now I struggle to put it into words. But it was a, an amazing experience. And it again took me deeper into who I am, who God is, and it opened up a whole different realm of time, going back in time, all of those things from that experience. And eventually, you know, I followed the river of life to beyond beyond where i found the gateways or the doorways into other dimensions and ante rooms and other things now all of these experiences are by following the path to the source i was drawn to the source you know they're all amazing experiences and i won't want you just to be caught up in the experience it's what the experience was doing i was drawn to the lakar to the romance to the intimacy that the father was orchestrating in preparing my life to go deeper and deeper into this reality. And Revelation 22, 1, he showed me a river of the water of life, crystal, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life. 
And that verse, again, became a doorway that I used to encounter the river, the tree of life, the throne, the pathway beside the river that I would walk on. You know, these are all absolutely amazing things. You know, so the deeper I've gone in my relationship with the Father, the more I've come to know the Father's heart. The Father's heart has two real major priorities, the restoration of our sonship and the restoration of all things. And next time I'll share some of my stories, journals and conversations that the Father had with me relating to our sonship, restoration and our origin. And from there, you know, we can go deeper and deeper into that experience. When God starts to reveal what there is beyond for us to experience, what there is to go deeper into his love, into this amazing place of joy and peace and intimacy. Yeah, it is it is absolutely amazing. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna finish there and we'll go into an activation. And maybe we'll go into an activation where we can engage the river of life or you can you can go wherever God takes you to go. Um, but ultimately if we're going to experience first love, we have to abandon our soul into the trust of God who loves us unconditionally. We cannot maintain control and we can't do it our own way. We have to let him do it his way. Let him orchestrate the journey. Let him direct that journey for you. Don't try and run ahead. Walk with him. Follow his lead. When there's time that you need to get out the boat and sink into that unconditional love, when there's time you need to get into the river or you need to embrace the throne of grace, just allow him to lead you on that and open the door to those experiences. And, you know, when you have an encounter, we're, we're going to do this encounter, but I want you to be clear that you can go wherever the Father leads you into whatever the experience the Father wants you to have. I'm just going to lead the exercise to open the door for you to have the experiences. You don't have to follow where I'm going or what I suggest. Be open to be led and to flow wherever the Father wants you to, to go and whatever he wants to show you and how much he wants that love. But whenever you have an experience, coming to a place of love is the key to start. Learn how to meditate. You might want to use music to meditate. You can use different breathing things to meditate. But ultimately, it is becoming still so that the distractions that may be in the way just dis evaporate and you begin to enter in. So I'd encourage you now just to get, get comfortable, close your eyes, come to a place of rest, begin to fix your thoughts upon engaging with God as Father or Jesus as your friend, brother, and begin to slow down your breathing. Breathe deeply. Breathe deeply through your nose and hold it and slowly breathe it out. And breathe in deeply and slowly breathe out. And as you're breathing in, and as you're breathing out, you're experiencing the unconditional love of the Father. You're experiencing God's unconditional love. You're breathing in that flow of love into your very being. Every part of you is being filled and still. But God is loving you. Coming to a place that you're safe in this place. Cocooned in love. This is the place where you can abandon yourself by figuratively getting out of the boat, by letting go, by sinking into that vast ocean of unconditional love. 
where you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into love. Where he will begin to restore love to you. His relationship with you. You're in that safe place. Come and choose that place of surrender right now. Spend a few minutes in that place where you're just sinking into love. If you want to stay there, feel free just to stay floating in that place of rest, peace and love. But if you want to go further, I encourage you just to fix your thoughts now on engaging the Father face to face. Let those thoughts form in your imagination. Picture a door in your spirit, first love gate. The handle is on your side. Choose to open the door. Invite Father, Son, Spirit in to embrace you, hug you, to breathe life into you. Just receive that life. As he loves you and tells you he loves you, that he loves you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Enjoy that embrace. Heart to heart. receive the impartation of his heart of love to you. Feel the warmth of his embrace. Feel his affirmation, his acceptance, his approval that you are his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. Hear him say it. 
You are my beloved son, daughter, in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. Stay in that place as long as you want, enjoying the embrace. If you'd like to go from that place into Eden, following the flow of the river, you can ask the Father to take you. The door is open behind you, you've opened it. You can step back through that door. The river is flowing. Get in the river and let the river take you up into the realm of heaven. You're now at the source. The heavenly flow. You're in the river of life. Within Eden. God's garden. You're in that river. You can sink, you can float, you can drink in the water, you can breathe in the water, just enjoy splashing around, being in that river, get comfortable being in that river, in that life, in the energy that's flowing. And if you look into the water, you may see gems or scrolls or other things. Swim down. Take those that you feel drawn to. Take them and eat. Place them within you and receive the life, the truth, the impartation that they contain. And as you take it into you, it bursts open with energy, fills you with truth and life and love.
If you're enjoying there, you can just stay there. If you want to go further, just look up the river. You can see in the distance there's a waterfall. You can just flow up that river to the waterfall. You can get out of the river. There's a path that's beside the river that you can walk on. Whichever you prefer. Look to that waterfall. The path will take you under the waterfall. The river goes into the waterfall. Just go to the waterfall. And as you're under that water, cascading down, the love of God, cascading down over you, in you, feel his love for you. Feel the energy, the life, the desire, the intention he has for you. The sound of many waters resonates in that water. Let it resonate within your heart, within your spirit. Be entrained by it. Come into the resonant frequency with it. God loves all equally the same. As you feel God's love for you, feel God's love for others. Feel his love, his compassion for you. Feel his love for others and feel the inspiration that you can love others the way he loves you. Receive how he loves you to empower you to love others. Anyone comes to mind that you struggle to love? Anyone that may have hurt you rejected you, abandoned you, abused you, anyone that you struggle to love. Receive God's love and release God's love to them by choosing to forgive them and release them if you've not done that before. Release what you freely received. Feel free to stay in that 
feel free to go beyond that if you want to go further. 